All right, so here we are on this Memorial Day weekend, and I thought since this is the time when we, one of those times where we pay extra particular attention to those who have served in our military service and civil services, uh, men and women who've been willing to uh, lay down their lives for us and display courage in that manner, I thought it would be fitting for us to call those of us who are professing Christ followers, those of us who believe that Jesus died on a cross for our sins, and God loved us so much he sent Jesus to do that, and we received him into our life. For us, what would it look like for Christ followers to demonstrate courage for the cause of Christ? And so what I want to do this morning is uh, take us to a passage that's going to kind of call us all out that as followers of Christ, we should... We should be courageous, not cowards. Um, if you have trusted in Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the same Spirit, Romans says, that raised Jesus from the dead. You have that power in you. You have Christ in you. Colossians says it's the hope of glory. And so with that power, there's, it's not a spirit of fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 puts it this way in the Net Bible. For God did not give us or give you a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and self-control. So we're called as Christ followers to be courageous, not cowards. He's calling you. He's calling me. He's calling us as a collective church family to be more courageous for the cause of Christ. Your old DNA, who you are without God, who you are in your flesh alone, is only a spirit of fear, anxiety, worry, despair. But that's not what you have in you. You have God in you. You have Christ in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You no longer have a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and of a sound mind or self-control. I believe, as we look at this passage today, there's... What we call, those of us who communicate the scriptures and study it, uh, what we're looking for as we're studying the scriptures are those timeless truths. What did God say 3,500 years ago to this person that has application for you today where you are? And I think the timeless truth that we're going to see today is that God has a mission for each of you that he wants you to be courageous in. A mission that he does not want you to cower from or be a coward in. A mission that God is specifically calling you to be courageous in. You have the option, but God is calling you to be courageous. I think about our students today. I'm going to our, our elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. God is calling our students to be more courageous for the cause of Christ. Um, Nowadays, social media runs rampant with doing things and saying things, posting things on Snapchat, Instagram, uh, FaceTime, things that are out of bounds, things that are inappropriate, things that are not of God. And God is calling students to be courageous and to be more devoted to Christ. He's calling singles in a day and age where sex before marriage is just, it's just as if it's just understood. He's saying no more. He's saying, singles, I'm calling you to a level of purity, and it's going to call you to be courageous. Now, and you're going, Kurt, it's too late. That's already water over the dam. I'm saying, no, I'm t- t- today, today forward, let God speak to your heart about being courageous for God. And how about you young couples? You need to live out your courage, living fully devoted for Christ and not giving in to the magnet of materialism that is so strong, that's pulling and tugging at your heart. Or there's also a prevailing prevailing attitude of apathy that you have to be conscious of and be courageous in. And also along with that, be careful of the delusion of the American dream, which is chasing the almighty dollar. Young couples, God is calling you to be courageous, to make a stand, to follow him in ways you never have before. Young ladies, I want to speak to you for a moment. Those of you who may find yourself expecting inside or outside the covenant of marriage and are contemplating whether or not to let the baby go to term and deliver. We challenge you to be courageous and to not abort a little one. Husbands and wives, this morning God is calling you to a greater level of courage in your relationship with your spouse, a greater level of faithfulness, a greater level of commitment to being unconditional in your love for your spouse. Moms and dads, I'd like to speak to you for a moment. 
that God has done something very special for you in allowing you a unique opportunity that only you have to be the parent of your children. And God is calling you to live courageously for him, full devotion to him, to not compromise, um, to, to not waver in your faith or your commitment or your loyalty to God or to his cause. He's calling you to model what it means to be committed to Christ, to the local church, to biblical community, to service, generosity, all these things. And they come from walking with God and being courageous in God. What I'd like to do to set the backdrop for our lesson this morning from Joshua chapter 1 is I've asked Brittany if she would come up. And she's going to read to you the first five verses that kind of set the stage for a Joshua, who going forth in our message, I'll call him Yahshua in Hebrew. Yeshua. So listen to the backdrop. This is the setting in which God is going to call Joshua to a very specific mission. Listen. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aide, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon and from the great river of Euphrates to all the Hittite country and into the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all of the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. So the backdrop is the children of Israel have been delivered miraculously out of bondage in Egypt, but because of unbelief have found themselves wandering endlessly year after year in the wilderness. This is after God delivered them miraculously from Egypt, miraculously got them across the Jordan, miraculously provided for their daily needs through manna and taking them to wells when they were thirsty. It's when God had miraculously guided and directed them through a pillar, a cloud by day and fire by night. God had been with them, and yet in their unbelief, they still had not entered into the promised land. In fact, Moses took them all the way up to the, to the borders of the promised land, but because of his unbelief, was not allowed to enter in. Now, what Brittany just read is that Moses now has passed away. Joshua, who was an aide to Moses, God had been preparing and equipping because God had a specific mission. He was going to pass the baton from Mo over to Yeshua. Now, here's what I want you to think about. I don't know your circumstances, I don't know your situation, but I believe that God has a specific mission that he's calling you to be strong and courageous in. Something that's just fitting for you, not for me, not for somebody else, but a specific mission that God has for you. And some of you will have multiple missions that God is calling you to be strong and courageous in. Uh, myself, I, I feel fairly confident that God has called me to several things. One is to, first and foremost, to my bride, uh, 29 years, just uh, to be committed and to be strong and courageous in our relationship. We have six children together. And to be strong and courageous, they're a mission for us as a husband and wife to invest in continually and uh, regularly throughout our week. This local church and each of you, I was telling Beth this week, I was standing by, we have a little bar top, and I was standing there and I was just telling Hunman, I said, I just can't believe that God lets me do what I get to do. I get to study the word, and then I get to feed sheep. I want you to know that I take it seriously. If there's one thing I'm incredibly diligent, and, and I, I stay to the task in this, I protect the time so that I can feed you something from the word of God every week, and I feel blessed to do it. My goal in that is that you'll grasp the truths of God and allow them to sink into your heart and change your life. Now, fourth mission I believe God has called me to, and probably each of us, is to the unconvinced people. I have a really I have a real strong heart and a pull towards those who don't know God. And so in my daily walk in different places, this week I had the chance to share the gospel and lay it out for somebody who knows they're missing something. And so that's part of my mission field. Now, I want to go back to the last verse that Brittany read, because this sets us up. Joshua 1.5 says, no one, God speaking to Joshua, Yeshua, no one will be able to stand against you 
all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So the mission that God is calling you today is, God would say very similar things to you today. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to kind of be thinking, what's, man, what's that mission, God, that you're calling me to? Or missions. Let's say this verse together. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. One of the reasons that we can be confident and go forward with courage and not be a coward is because of the character of God. God is a covenant-keeping God. He's a promise-keeping God. And not only that, God is sovereign. He's completely in charge of all things. Nothing ever catches God by surprise. There's no accidents with God. It's not like he didn't know this was going to happen or this was going to happen. He's completely sovereign. So you can trust him. Now, the passage that we're going to look at, we're going to look at four verses. And three times in these next four verses, we're going to see this phrase, be strong and courageous. I want to share with you why I believe you can be, why I can be, and why we can be strong and courageous. Yeshua 1.6 says this. God speaking to Yeshua. He says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. So here's the timeless principle for you, for me. As God had a mission that was very specific and tailored for Yeshua and had prepared him for it, he has a mission for you. He has a mission for me. He has a mission for all of us. A very specific mission. In this passage, he's speaking certainly directly to Yeshua. And it's a clear command. It's not a suggestion. And it's 3,500 years old. But the timeless truth is as he had a mission for Yeshua, he has a mission for you. It says here, to be strong and courageous. I want to speak to you about strong and courageous. The idea is strong. When he's saying Yeshua, be strong. He's saying Yeshua on the inside, in here. Be strong in your faith. Be strong in your devotion. Be yielded. Be fully devoted to me, Yeshua. Not partial. What would it look like if followers of Christ today became fully devoted followers? No compromise. No rational lies. No, you get that part of my life, God, but I get this part of my life. What would it look like if the church today said we're going to be fully devoted? Strong in our faith. He's calling us to be strong in our faith. Strong in our devotion. Strong in our commitment. Strong in our, our, um, our commitment to following Jesus with fully devoted hearts. I put it this way. Be inwardly strong so that you will be outwardly courageous. The way one becomes outwardly courageous is because they become internally, inwardly strong. You will never be outwardly courageous unless you are inwardly strong. So followers, it begins with being strong so that you will be courageous. Three times he says, Yeshua, be strong and courageous. And what happens is you have two possible responses. In your flesh, who you are without God, that's who all of us, we came into this world, we have flesh. We have a flesh response. And I want to show you, a flesh response is when your flesh faces fear, it will automatically flee or fight as a natural response. We think sometimes people who are like really hardcore, tough guys, bad to the bone, like, wow, they really got courage. Well, a lot of times they're just natural responses to fear, and it's how they respond. All of us respond to fear naturally, either by fleeing something or wanting to fight. The spirit response is what he's calling us to. It's when your spirit faces something to be feared, and he will guide you to a supernatural response. So if you're a student, you're walking in with other Christ followers, and there's a person who's anti-God, anti-Jesus, and you know they're very confrontational, And they're about to rain on your parade. But your spirit says it's okay. I can still pray before my meal in front of this person. Even though when I say amen, I know they're going to say something to me. Or maybe the spirit says, hey, later, I want you to go to them on the side and have a conversation with them. 
but it's a spirit response. It's not a flesh response. Flesh will flee and fight. The spirit, you follow the spirit. The spirit will lead you to what and how he wants you to respond. Well, there's a couple of things about this mission I want to mention to you. As you're thinking about your mission, what it is that God is calling you to do. Uh, Yeshua's mission here is leading a bunch of people <laughs> uh, who've already been out of bondage and wandering in the desert land into what's called the promised land, but it's full of enemies. So they have to cross water and go into enemy territory. So this is a pretty, pretty crazy mission that God is calling Yeshua to. You're wondering how many people are there? I'm glad you asked. Numbers 2651, there's kind of a census of all the people who were traveling. And it says there were 601,730 men. And then, 11 verses later, Numbers 2662, it lists that there were 23,000 Levites. And they didn't count them because they weren't given part of an inheritance because of the role serving God. But their, their numbers were recorded that they were Levites, so we know this. If you add those two together, you get 624,730 men. Now, people who study these things and calculate these things and so forth say, estimate that there was probably over 2 million when you throw in the women and you throw in the little ones. There's probably over 2 million people that Yeshua is being called to lead. Now, imagine, wrap your minds around 2 million people and you've been called to lead them from a wandering place where they've been for quite a while now into the promised land. Where would you begin? How would you do it? How many people is that? Anybody know how many people live in Dallas in the Metroplex? Any idea? In 2016, 2016, um, if you look online, an approximate estimate of 1.3 million people. Houston, in 2016, um, it was recorded at having 2.3 million. So imagine leading the population of somewhere between Dallas and Houston out of the desert, across a river, and into enemy territory. Does that feel like that's like an overwhelming mission? Now, here's what I want you to think. I want to share with you that I believe the mission God is calling to you will require no less supernatural. It's just that big of a mission. And he has it for each one of you as a follower. And he's placed in you his spirit. It's a spirit, not a fear, but it's a power, love of a sound mind. And if you will walk with God on this mission, you will see God do amazing things both in and through you. He has a mission. Here's what I want you to see. That as God had a mission for Yeshua, he has a specific tailored mission for you. And here's some amazing truths about your mission that I think are similar to Yeshua's. It will require supernatural. I just described for you the number of people and the fact that they have to cross water and they're going into enemy territory. People who hate them. People who don't want them in their neighborhoods and in their communities. People who are willing to fight so that they can't enter. That's that mission field. Your mission field will require no less the supernatural. The second thing, it will demand faith. Be strong, Yeshua. Be strong in here so that you will be courageous out there. If you're not strong here, Yeshua, we're not crossing the water. If you're not strong here, you're not listening to me and you're not obeying me and we're not conquering enemies. But if you will be strong with me in here, we will be outwardly courageous out there. It'll demand your faith, Yeshua, but I will do amazing things if you'll trust me. That's translated to each of you in your mission. It's going to require faith. It also will move others towards God. You see this over and over, that God is purposing to draw people to himself. Uh, In Peter, it says, it's the will of God that that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So he has you strategically placed in families and neighborhoods and communities and in lines at Walmart or Target or Tom Thumb or Kroger's or wherever you shop. He has you strategically placed and on mission that other lives might be impacted by how you live for him. And some of you, it's right in your own home, how you're living with your spouse or how you're living with your kids. What are you modeling? Are you modeling full devotion to them, being strong in your faith and outwardly courageous? The fourth thing about this mission, it'll have generation and eternal impacts. The generations and eternity was changed because of Yeshua's commitment to following and being strong 
and courageous for God. So you have a mission. Now, as we move to the middle section of this little, these three verses, these four verses, uh, Yeshua 1, 7, and 8. Let me read it. It says, Be strong and very courageous. Second time God came back and said it again. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. So God not only gave you a mission, but he gave you a real clear mission manual on how to walk through life and how to do life. How do you spend your time? What do you think? How do you invest? How do you live? It's all written down in God's manual. Now think about it with me. If statistics are true and they bear out, they bear out this truth. That few people in local churches today, if we were just do a raise of the hand of how many of you are in the Word on a daily basis, few people would say, yes, I'm in the Word on a daily basis. We go down and say, how many of you six times a day, or how many five times a day, or four times? You know that in a local church today, there are fewer and fewer followers of Jesus who are committed to being in the Word on a regular basis. And we wonder why we're not strong and why we're not courageous. When he's given us a manual on how to do life and be strong and be courageous... He didn't, say, he didn't say, Yeshua, I want you to get those two million people and I want you to go over there and you're just going to have to figure it out. <laughs> That's not what he said. he said. He said, here's the deal, Yeshua. I want you to be strong in here so that you'll be courageous out there. Here's what I want you to do. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it, not to the right, not to the left, so that you can be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so you may be careful to do everything written in it. Just see how God is raising the bar and, and the imperative nature of spending time in the word of God. Man, if you get nothing else today, get this. That God wants you in his manual. He wants you in his manual. He gave you a mission manual. And if you're going to accomplish any mission for God, you need to regularly be in the mission manual. It says here, be careful to obey twice. It says it in verse 7. It says it again in verse 8. Be careful. Be careful. When I think about careful, I think about being vigilant, diligent, very concentrated, very intentional. Some of you know that I like the outdoors. And one of the things that comes with being an outdoorsman is I love working with a chainsaw. I use it all the time. I know we live in Dallas and it's not like it's hot here or cold here much, but like I could cut firewood year round. I just love, I love trimming trees, felling trees, couple months back, a friend um, asked me if I would take down a tree. Love doing that. It's okay. So I go over there. This particular tree was a pretty big tree, and it was leaning over a fence into the neighbor's yard. So it was a little tricky. Had to rope it down and so forth. But uh, I watched my friend put the ladder up, and it was backwards. It was, wasn't right side up, and there's a reason. There's a front and a back to a ladder. <laughs> when you put a ladder up right, it has feet on it. And that gives it a certain stability. So you can lean on it left and right and so forth, and it won't, it'll just stay. Well, I watched the ladder go up backwards, but I thought, well, okay, rather than, say, rather than say something, I'm just trekking up the ladder. I get up the ladder. My feet are at about 16 feet. My upper torso about 20, 21 feet. I'm reaching out to trim off a limb with the chainsaw, and then in about a second... No more than a second, I found myself underneath the ladder. Now imagine this. The ladder was set up there like this, and now sitting on the point of the ladder, not the feet of the ladder. And so when I shifted my weight, it just flipped the ladder, just like that. So I am hanging in the air, upside down. <laughs> and I could tell I was not in a good spot. Literally, before I started to fall, I had about... Probably another second, maybe less. My weight started pulling me down. <laughs> but uh, as soon as I ended upside down, I had both hands on the chainsaw, so I couldn't grab anything. So I threw the chainsaw, and I took jujitsu when I was little. And in jujitsu, when you get thrown, they teach you to slam the mat. And you think people do that just for drama and to make noise. They really are doing it to break their fall. And so two things came to mind. This is not good. i got to get rid of the chainsaw. On my way down, I thought I got to break my fall. So I put my hands out like this, and it, it happened all like this. 
But my butt and my back hit. God had a fence underneath me, eight feet tall, with a two by eight on top. And I landed flat on top of it. Saul's down there on the ground. I'm laying there going, thank you, God. (laughs) My friend came around the house. He had taken a load of wood. He knew I was not supposed to be laying on the fence with the saw on the ground. Uh, But here's the reason I tell you this story. When God is saying to Yeshua, I want you to be careful to obey. He is saying, hey, follower, I want you to pay attention to every detail. Because if you let one little detail go unattended to, guess what? It could cost you your life. I'll tell you, he taught me in that moment that when I see something that is not right, I need to make it right. Because it could be very costly. Believers, he is calling us to a higher level of commitment, a higher level of paying attention to the detail, a a higher level of walking in obedience to what he has recorded. And if you're going to be strong in here, you will not do it without spending time in here. Believers, I cannot urge you enough to spend time regularly in the word. Every time I write the elders a letter about anything I include in those I purposely try to there's probably times I haven't but most of the time I encourage them spend time in the word today and be praying for one another and for the church family we've got to be very careful to pay attention to the details and then he says this don't turn from the right don't turn to it from the right or to the left In other words, don't justify, don't rationalize, don't compromise. What we're doing is we're kind of doing our own thing and kind of giving God all the reasons why it's okay. And he says, that's got to stop, church. Christ followers, it's got to stop today. If you're going to walk out of here being strong and courageous, you can't be looking left, can't be looking right. No more compromise, no more more justifying. Do you know what our number one value is at Stillwater? Our number one pillar. Can somebody tell me this morning what our number one pillar is? Anybody? Centered on Christ. There's a reason for that. Satan spends his entire mission trying to get your eyes off of Christ. Getting you to turn right. Getting you to turn. This would be right. Or left. You're right. That's what Satan does. He tries to tell you circumstances, situations, comments. TV, whatever he can do to get your minds off of Christ and onto something else or someone else. And the Lord is saying to Yeshua, Yeshua, do not turn to the right or to the left. Don't do it. Don't do it. And if you you follow me, if you're careful to obey, you don't turn to the right or to the left, guess what? He says, you're going to be successful wherever you go. You want that. I want that. We want that. God has that for you if you'll be strong and courageous. We become inwardly strong by being careful to obey God's word. And we be, then we can become outwardly courageous by living out the word. So Joshua obeys the word. Guess what? They cross the river, the Jordan. They obeys. They walk around the city. They had mighty men of valor all ready to fight. God says, no, I know you guys know how to know how to do battle, and I know you're well, you trained and all that. I want to show you it's my power. So rather than take down Jericho with your power, how about you just walk around that city and just be real quiet? What? Yeah. I want you to see that it's me, not you. You just be strong in here, be courageous out there, and I'm going to get the supernatural stuff done. But guess what happens when there's a little compromise? You turn a little left, turn a little right. You're not careful to obey. They go conquer Jericho, which seemed like an insurmountable deal. Huge walls, and God brings them down. Then they go to a little place called Ai, where where I, it's spelled A-I. Some call it A-I, some call it I. It's a small city, a couple thousand people. Should have been a no-brainer. If you can take Jericho, you can take Ai. And they go to do battle, and guess what? They leave running and fleeing and having their tails between their legs and losing some of their men. And they're all going, what happened, God? What happened, God? What happened, God? Yeah, there's sin in the camp. Somebody compromised. 
What? Somebody compromised? Yes. I ask you specifically not to take one devoted thing from the spoils, and you did. Somebody did. What? Yeah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to call them out, Yeshua, in the morning. Call them out by tribe. And then I want you to call them out by clan. And then I want you to call them out by family. And then I want you to call them out man by man. Imagine having 600,000 people and Yeshua goes, he calls out the tribe and the tribe is named and they step forward. And he calls out the clan and another group steps forward. And he crawls out a family and the family steps forward. And then he says, and here's the man. The man is Achan and Achan steps up and Yeshua says, give glory to God. And he says, yes, it was me. I coveted. I saw those things. I saw the Babylonian robe. It was beautiful. I saw the silver. I saw the wedge of gold. I coveted it. I put it under my tent. And that little compromise cost people lives. And it cost the nation of Israel severely as a people. And it cost Achan and it cost him his family. Church family, I want you to hear me this morning. God takes disobedience very, very serious. And he will discipline disobedience. He loves you and he wants to move you to himself, but he will not let you flippantly disobey him. And church family, can I tell you, there is way too much compromise in the church of God. We just, all we're doing is looking if somebody else is doing it, and that's what we're doing. Can I tell you, if most of the people are doing it, followers of Christ probably should not be doing it. Anyhow, you get the point. He gave you a mission, and he gave you a mission manual. Church family, don't miss this. He wants to honor obedience. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be successful. You've got to follow him. In conclusion, Joshua 1.9 is the third time the Lord says to Yeshua, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And I want you to hear me. God has given you a mission. He has given you a mission manual, and God is with you in your mission. You're not doing this thing alone. In fact, he says, I'll never leave. I'll never forsake you. When he says to him, be strong and courageous, he's giving him a command. It's not option. It's not a suggestion. Hey, Yeshua, I got an idea I want you to think about. No, he said, here's here's the mission I have for you. And some of you, it's that clear. He's putting on your heart a mission that God wants you to go at really hard. And he wants you to be strong in your faith and fully devoted to him so that you will be outwardly courageous in that situation that God is calling you to be courageous in so that God then will do amazing things in that situation. He is with you. Can I have you stand? I'm going to share with you a quick little story. When I was a kid, your dad, real outdoorsy, our whole family kind of outdoorsy. I remember really early on going with dad on hunting trips. I can remember some of my first few times when I went with dad, uh, 11 or 12 years old, carrying a gun, pitch dark, and dad out in front of me and just kind of following him. And I remember as long as I was with dad, I was like, okay. It didn't matter. It was dark because I was with dad. Whether I was beside my dad or I was behind my dad, in sight, I felt okay. But I can still remember pretty vividly because he would drop me off at my stand an hour before daylight so he had a chance to get to his stand. And I remember that was a long hour for me when I was young. Sitting in the dark, and that's with a 30-odd six laying across my legs. (laughs) I was still scared because my dad had left. I want to remind you this morning that God is calling you on a mission. He's given you a mission manual, and he's not leaving you. He is going to go with you every step of the way. He's calling you church. He's calling us church to be strong, to be strong inwardly so that we will be supernaturally courageous outwardly. Let me pray for you. God, I find it no coincidence, no accident, no surprise to you who was listening today, who will listen later online, to your truth. And you're a big God, a loving God. Thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us and for giving us the Holy Spirit. That's not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 
I pray that you would call each person here to a new level of devotion. Help them be supernaturally strong inwardly so that they can be outwardly courageous wherever you have them on mission. Do great things, Lord, supernatural things in and through them for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, you're dismissed. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. Can't wait to see you next weekend.